Hello there, welcome. My name is Rachel Erickson and I'm the gallery manager at Columbia Center for the Arts. We are located at 215 Cascade Avenue, right in downtown Hood River. Our hours are 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. We are here today with Don Bailey, who is the artist featured in our entryway gallery of our show that is opening Friday, February 4th at the center. The show is titled Will Zolik, which is in his native Hoopa language means storytelling or tell me a story. Don is an accomplished contemporary painter who has been featured on the Oregon public broadcasting television show Artbeat and in an Oregon Arts Watch. His work is in the collection of the Halley Ford Museum, the State Library of Oregon, City Hall in Portland, Oregon, the collection of the Chemoa Indian School in Salem, Riverfront Park in Salem, R.B. Ravens Gallery in Rancho de Taos, New Mexico, and several private collections. He's also a member of Blackfish Gallery in Portland, Oregon. So welcome, Don. Let me just say it's such a pleasure to be chatting with you today. We always enjoy having you as our guest here at CCA, and I'm very intrigued to learn more about you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I know you're very busy this month, so thank you again for taking the time to join us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. So why don't we start with um, just sharing a little bit about you and your love of art? Okay. I'll, um... I'll start briefly in the in the beginning. Um, I was born in uh, on the Hoopa Valley Reservation in Northern California um, many many years ago, and uh, so uh, growing up, I, I've always had a an interest in in what I thought was art, and most of it I think was drawing. I, I kind of like drew everything, and looking back on that now. Um, I believe it was more more like cartoons and things like that that I that I drew. Yeah. Um, but I've, that interest has always been there. I don't, I don't know why. I never I never really questioned it, and I didn't get. I had art in, in high school, but again, I was never serious about that. It was it was a class where I can get an easy grade, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, I got serious about it probably my uh, my sophomore year in college. So. Um, and ever since then, it's always been there for me. Awesome. And how, how did you come up with the theme of this exhibition? Well, I, I, uh, that was pretty easy. That's the easy one, as you, as you know, or, or maybe, maybe not. Uh, some of you do that. You know, that's what Indians do. They tell stories. And, uh, and, and I happen to do it visually, either through drawings or, or my painting. Um, and, uh, so what I want to do is, um, I, I want to tell a story, but I don't want to be explicit about it. I want to leave it open-ended so that the viewer can also have, uh, they can have their own narrative, if you will, um, an interpretation of what they think uh, they see. So I can lead you into it a little bit. But I'm uh, obviously I'm not going to say this is this is what it's supposed to be or that. I mean, I, I leave that completely to interpretation of the viewer. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Well, the work is just so impressive. So I'm excited for everyone <laughs> to get you. a chance to make their own interpretations and view your work. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I'm also interested to know um, what your art process looks like for you. How did you go about? choosing these pieces specifically um, for the exhibition and, and was there a process for this? Yeah, um, not specifically for this one, although it, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good number of uh, pieces that kind of round out what I'm about. And I'll explain that. My process is I work from uh, uh, archival black and white photographs that I find that I find that I think need to tell a story and I try to to change the narrative by um, either subtracting or adding elements um, to the painting 
so it is so in that, in that sense it is a process um so if if i am telling a narrative then i use all those um instruments to do so um the color the color is one thing i add to uh my portraits to suggest another perhaps another story um other than the what the photographer probably intended that he was or she was documenting about um, a vanishing race. In other words, I, I want to put the humanity back into um, these photos, these people, and make them real and, and not just a record of them. Um, because, I, you know, I think the photographers had obviously other goals that were intended uh, our purposes. So what I'm doing is recontextualizing um, through my use of color um, our objects that I put in our legal. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really incredible. Um, so the reason that, yeah, the, the, I, I think the paintings that I'm showing at the Columbia Center is uh, expresses a, a wide range of um, the things that I do. I mean, there are narrative paintings there, and then there are paintings that are just completely um, the portraits. Mm -hmm. And what I've done, if you could see the original black and white, um, I've used my own color, my own expression. And uh, then I leave that to the viewer to come away with what does the color say to do for them? You know, it's, it's open ended. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to see those photographs. Oh, yeah, I know a lot of people ask about them, but I think, you know, sometimes I think I want to show them and then other times I think, you know, it's it's probably better off that that only I see them. So, yeah. You know, so I, I don't know. It's kind of a mixed, mixed yeah. blessing. Or, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, you are co-currently showing with Native artists in our Contemporary Native Voices, Prints from Crow's Shadow exhibit. Mm -hmm. Are there any artists you have a particular connection with in the show or would like to talk about? We heard you might have a special connection with Rick Bartow. Oh, yeah. Rick, uh, Rick was a close friend and a brother. We worked to... Uh, well, we just we hung out together, but we worked together often. He came to the school, uh, Shamao Indian School, and did workshops for our kids, uh, probably once a year for for a while. Um, but then we worked on a collaboration of um, sculptural poles that we did for the dormitory, hmm. and Rick made uh, made it important uh, that these were not to be known as uh, totem poles. You know, that would be appropriating somebody else's um, heritage and stuff. And neither of we're both California Indians. And so we don't, we don't have totems where we come from. So we, we made these sculpture poles um, out of uh, um, a cedar, Western cedar tree that uh, we had cut down and donated uh, from a person on the, uh, living on the coast. And so both of these poles are like 23 feet long. Yeah. And uh, after we sculpted them and, and uh, we threw up there permanently now in the dormitory at the Shmo Indian School. Uh, and, uh, you know, I used to go over to Rick's place and he'd show me uh, what he was currently working on or trying to do. And uh, we'd go to breakfast and uh, just talk about art. It was great. Um, but the other person too, I, I believe she's in the show is uh, Lillian Pitt. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, uh, she's come out to the school and did workshops also. Um, and we've exhibited, I think, two or three times together. Mm -hmm. uh, we're pretty close. In fact, uh, Lillian designed uh, our wedding rings, oh, you know, years ago. Yeah. So she's, she's a really a good friend. Um, I've known her for a long time and, and uh, she's, she's a good person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we we love Lillian Pitt. Yeah, she's yeah. And so I mean, who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's been right. so important and inspiring in, in everything that we're doing. Oh, wow. Yeah. She's so impressive. Right. 
Um, and are there any other artists or people in your life that you found that inspire you in your creative process? Um, I guess number one would be um, to this day uh, as a Kiowa artist out of Oklahoma. His name is T.C. Cannon. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he went to IAIA, Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and uh, graduated, I think, during the middle 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, as during that time, as you know, uh, that was the civil rights movement going on. Mm -hmm. um, AIM was going on, American in Indian movement was going on, and also uh, Vietnam was going on. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, T.C. Cannon is so very talented. He's a, a, what I would call the storyteller of all storytellers. Um, if, you, if you look at one of his paintings, you can pick one and look at the title mm -hmm. and you try to get something out of it. Um, it's probably not what he intended, obviously. In fact, it's probably 180. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, uh, he stayed away from, on purpose, as, as most Indian artists did at that time, um, doing sentimental imagery, stereotyping, or, you know, they always doing the cliche type. Mm -hmm. um, that was totally, you know, a movement totally against all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll give you an example of what he painted. You know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is run by, in the government, a larger organization called the Department of the Interior, mm -hmm. okay? So he did this painting and it's called, um, and, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by him. It's, it's titled Apple Picking, it's Apple Picking Time in the BIA, okay? Um, Apple sometimes was used to mean for uh, Native Americans, especially those who weren't fully uh, connected to their culture, is uh, red on the outside but white on the inside. Okay. Mm. So, who do you think turned around and bought this painting? It was the Department of the Interior. <laughs> and so that that was. Uh, that was a big thing. And, and uh, I think he got a, a big kick out of that. But it goes to show his work is he's kind of a coyote or a trickster mm. because what you see is not what you're getting. And so I, I've always I've always looked on that guy is, uh, you know, if I can put stuff in my work where people think they're seeing one thing, but there really is another one in there. You don't have a painting by by there, but it's entitled Convenience. And, it, and I'm just going to sidetrack here for a minute. Yeah. Um, it's three girls in 1915 or so at a boarding school, and they're all sitting around the sewing machine, and they're sewing, right? Mm -hmm. And behind them is the matron or the woman. It's just like she's trying to, you know, she's the headmaster. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so this is from an original photograph. Okay, so one of the girls is sewing what appears to be American flag. Well, I obviously that flag wasn't there in the photo, but I put it in. Um, and when I had my show in September in Portland, mm -hmm. a lady came up to me and, and she said, that is so patriotic that these young girls are sewing, the, sewing the, the American flag. And, you know, I'm not going to sit there and disagree with her. I'm going, yes, that's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful scene, you know. So, I mean, this is kind of what T.C. Cannon was about. And I, I like to put a little bit of that in my work, too. So if that'll give you a little clue or hand down a road when people look at my work, there may be another means in there, too, you know. So yeah, I love that. Um, yeah. And on that subject, uh, I noticed in many of your works, you depict um, children as your subjects. And you taught art at Chemoa Indian Boarding School, which is the oldest continually operating federal boarding school in North America. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the background of the school, your experience yeah. there, and how yeah. that has influenced you in your own art? Yeah, first of all, I think it's, it's so ironic and it's, at, uh, after retiring, 
from teaching there for so many years, over 35. One of the things I, I said when I graduated from high school was that I would never work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And look at me, I ended up working for those many years. Um, but we can get that at the very end. Um, in 1880, in Forest Grove, uh, Shamala was, was uh, introduced. Mm -hmm. And then five years later, 1885, it was moved to Salem, Oregon. Um, it's run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and has a long history of uh, civilization, you know, trying to transition these and taking kids off the reservation. Um, a lot of times by force from their parents and uh, through acculturation, um, teaching them in the beginning, if not for a long time, trades that they they would never use or need for that matter but anyway it, it got better as the years progressed especially during the the late 40s and 50s to up until now where it's it's more modernized for this transition into college secondary um one thing about this school besides the kids themselves um year to year there would be probably between 65 to 70 different nations represented. So when these kids come to one school like that and they get introduced to each other's culture, it's pretty fun to see. But also see, it was a growing experience for me to see all these different cultures uh, every year. Um, and not only that, but if we sometimes, a lot of times we didn't have the same kid when they were freshmen through their senior year. They drop out or they just wouldn't come back. Mm -hmm. um, I think my last 10 years of teaching there, we finally got kids finally that went the whole four years there. And that was amazing because I could see the growth, especially in art, uh, what they started as a freshman and what they were doing when they graduated. Mm -hmm. um, probably that was the biggest thing for me is because, you know, as a teacher, um, you learn from them too. And, uh, you know, I'm not talking about just the visual arts, but the culture. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, besides the bureaucracy and administration, I think uh, that's one thing I still miss today is, is, is the kids, the students. Um, the rest of it, I don't. But uh, it was, it was a, for the most part, it, it was a, personally for me, it was a beneficial time uh, in my life. And I think that's, a lot of uh, inspiration for my own art comes from, you know, because you know, we had kids that were very traditional. And at the same time, we had kids that were urban who had didn't have a clue about their culture, but yet they had enough blood in that qualified them to go to the school. So we had both. And it was fun to see those kids, if they stayed there long enough, really want to investigate who they are and where they come from. So that was pretty neat to see. Yeah, that's really powerful. And yeah, really you were able to have that experience. Right. Um, and then, so could you also talk about the legacy of uh, Native artists that have come out of Chemoa and gone on to be successful artists across the country? Well, you know, when you, yeah, sure. I think uh, I had uh, one of them call me about six months ago out of the blue. Um, Farrell Cochran, he's in, uh, he was in Albuquerque, now he's selling in uh, Santa Fe. He's a painter and he's from uh, Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's doing very well. He's making a living. Uh, and there's another one from uh, Montana Browning, uh, Terrence Gardipi. Mm -hmm. He came, he came probably about five, six years later than Farrell. Um, but he does what you call ledger art. Mm -hmm. um, if you look him up, if you Google either one of them, especially Terrence, I'm, I'm amazed that he called oh, a couple of years ago. He didn't tell me how famous he was, but we had a good conversation. He, he sells all over. And I'm... Uh, pretty pleased with him. And then the other one is Emmy, Emmy Bitt. Um, she did sculpture 3D. 
uh, Shoshone, um, Shoshone Bannock from Idaho. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that um, all three of these, these kids had in common, which I've never had before or since, is that what I called um, they were they were Renaissance people. I mean, these kids could draw, they could paint, and they could sculpt. And uh, and I don't mean just like the middle of the road. I mean they, they were highly skilled, and I I'm, I was blown away. So for me as as an art teacher, it was like whoa, you know, I'm really ahead of the game. So it, it was fun. It, it was fun just kind of being there and. Uh, as a guidance, so yeah. That's cool. yeah. Glad you had that influence, and that's just really amazing that you you did that, and and now they're up and coming and established artists, and we'll have to check out their work. Yeah, I, I think as an art teacher, that's that's something that yeah. you're very fortunate, very fortunate if that happens, you know. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I just uh, want to continue on here. Um, I want to ask you about some of your imagery that you use in your work. Um, dive into that a little bit more. Um, I see that you have juxtaposed in a lot of your works, uh, such as the piece in your current exhibition here titled Lamy Station 1932. Um, and that's the depiction of well-known European artists, mm -hmm. uh, such as Jackson Pollock, Van Gogh, Matisse, uh, Picasso and more. Uh, and I'm fascinated to hear about your thought process in combining this aspect of art history into your work. Could you tell us a little bit more about that concept and what that means for you? Oh, sure. You know, as a, I think as a as a an art teacher, this comes natural, at least in my work. One of the things I'll point out uh, to add to your list of, of painters that I showed in that particular painting is Rothko. Francis Bacon uh, and T.C. Cannon, who I just talked about. And then the other one I, I always forget was uh, uh, Fritz Scholder, who was T.C.'s professor at IAIA. Um, so those four, those two anyway, those two native artists are right in the foreground and right behind to the right. Oh. But anyway, um, yes, as an, as, a, as an art teacher, I, I taught art history, you know, and that wasn't always easy to teach. And so you always had to make it fun for these kids to learn about other artists. Um, and so I thought that's one way for, for my viewer to have an opening into my work is if, okay, they recognize maybe a painter that maybe they heard of or maybe saw in a magazine or something or a history book or whatever. And they start to question of why, why is he are uh, showing up in this, and what role do they play? Mm -hmm. um, Lamy Station is a is a photograph from uh, a real station in Santa Fe and uh, uh, a railway that went from the east to Santa Fe during the '30s. Uh, specifically bringing all these tourist people from the east out to Santa Fe and what they were doing is they wanted to buy real authentic Native American art okay and at the same time this gets really because this, this gets complicated so the viewer is not going to write off see any of this mm -hmm. the government was pushing the Native Americans to sell their own work to make their own money to be to being uh, to, to trying to make them being self sufficient, okay, mm -hmm. not depending on the government. So you had two things going on here, but fundamentally behind it all was the fact that um, what these tourists were buying, whether it be pottery, kachinas, or whatever, mm -hmm. what they call curios. So then you have a dilemma there: um, were they buying crafts, or were does it turn into fine art? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm kind of presenting that. And this is, there's a lot in this painting. So I think it's worth talking to you about it, especially if people want to look at it a little more closely mm -hmm. because there's a lot going on there. Um, so I'm, I'm more or less asking the viewer when at what time 
during this history? Was, was it during the 30s or 40s or 50s? Did the art world accept art as Native American art, fine art? Um, and if so, when was that? Well, I have I have an answer. You know, I taught that in my art history classes. But so I'm not gonna, you know, give that information away. It's just a it's just a painting about questioning, and especially the main person you see in the middle is Jackson Pollock, mm -hmm. and he's doing his drip paintings, right? Yeah. Well, he just didn't discover that on his own. You know, during the late '40s, early, uh, he went to uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he watched a demonstration of uh, sand painting going on, where they they poured sand painting down and made swirls of it. So that's one of the um, inspirations that I think Jackson Pollock got. Um, so anyway, bring all these things into this one painting. Um, and I, I just asked the viewer to question all these things instead of being, oh, this is, looks like a, this looks like a train car full of uh, modern artists. And yet in the foreground, there are two Native American artists. So there's a lot going on in there. I'm glad you asked me about that one. Absolutely. And it's so important to question everything. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's, that was just a fascinating description you gave. So thanks for letting us hear your perspective on that. Sure. Yeah. Um, now, we at Columbia Center for the Arts also love to inspire younger generations of artists. And based on your experience as a professional artist, as well as an educator, uh, is there any advice you would give to future generations of artists? Um, I guess the, the most important thing would be keeping on, keeping on, um, because if you love what you're doing, just keep doing it. Um, because I tell you what, as you, as you get older, it's easy to, to make excuses of not finding the time to do it. In fact, sometimes as you get older, you want to put it off, um, and uh, what was taught to me when I was in uh, school, my advisor, um, before I went to graduate school, um, he told me, he said, you know, even times that I don't want to go out in the studio, even if there's times that I need to go out and I don't want to, I'll go out there and open the door, go in and clean some brushes, or just sit down, even if I don't work. So you have to, you have to make time for it. Um, I guess, it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I, it's one of those things that you never want to slip away from you. Um, if you have it now, you'll, you'll always have it, but you have to nourish it, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's great advice. And it's so important to inspire younger generations. And you've clearly done an amazing job of that in your career and uh, been able to inspire so many generations of artists to come. So um, yeah, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, well, thank you very much and, and I'm honored to be here. So thank you. Yeah, is there anything else you'd like to say about the show? Well, I, I think uh, if people listen to, to a little bit of what I've said and can get some coherence out of any of it, it might help them look at the paintings a little better. Yeah. The art. Yeah. Well, everyone should come in and see them because they're right. right. fabulous. So, well, excellent. Thank you, Don. Your show yeah. looks incredible. And we are just in constant awe of all that you are and that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Opening on February 4th, there will be an opening during First Friday. We won't be doing a big reception given that some of the COVID restrictions are going on right now, but our doors will be open for people to come in and celebrate with our artists. Um, so thank you for supporting and encouraging them. And thanks again, Don, for your energy and commitment to the arts and bringing us your beautiful work. No, thank you. Thank you.